and welcome. As always, I'm Abby. This is Stories Lived, Stories Told. And here's my question for today. What are the limits you place on yourself? A big part of using a communication perspective is looking at the patterns in our lives. And whether we like it or not, recognizing the ways that we contribute to those patterns, seeing ourselves as active participants in the creation of our social worlds, whether those social worlds are the kind that we want to be making or not. So what are the ways we limit ourselves? This is a good question to keep in mind for part two of this conversation with Rami. If you haven't listened to part one, you'll want to go back and do that first. Today, we are continuing our conversation by exploring both Rami and I's relationship to the Enneagram and the way that that has helped us to better understand ourselves and the limits we place on ourselves. Today, Rami's also going to share some stories about her own life and the way that she has met transformational moments. Let's jump in with Rami. We're always making a network of conversations, Mm. a network of conversations. So you can think about an organization actually equaling a network of conversations. Yeah. Conversations in the foreground and there are conversations in the background. What's more powerful? What do you think determines people's actions more? The ones that are in the foreground or official or the ones that are in the background? Mm, I'm tempted to say background. It's background. Yeah, those messages, you can internalize them, whether it's, yeah, said explicitly or not. Right. So how are we making it? Actually shining the light on how we make that which we are complaining about is really critical to shift and cause transformational change. You have to be able to see how you're making it. You have to be able to see that you are at cause there, (laughs) as well as some other people. You're not the sole cause, right? But you you are participating in it. How can you shift that? You can. It doesn't take a lot of people to shift it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take every single person. It takes people that are usually looked at as the social connectors. It takes the people with informal authority as well as formal authority, both. And there are a lot of them, informal authority. Mm -hmm. My work with the Enneagram helps me... um, help others make better social worlds in that people can become very aware of when their ego is driving a conversation Yes, by understanding their ego structure in the, with using the Enneagram and understanding what their quote essence structure is in the Enneagram. So I'll say it this way. So when we're born into life, ego isn't bad. It's just, it's functional. It, it helps us make things happen. Mm-hmm. But it's, it is, if we believe that we are, our personality is the ego, we are kidding ourselves. Yeah. And I mean, with if we believe our identity is our ego, we are kidding ourselves. So The work I do with the Enneagram is all about what are, and the Enneagram is about what are the motivations, not behaviors. Yeah. Yeah. Most people, most personality assessments look at uh, behaviors. Mm -hmm. There's an element to looking at behaviors, but the real critical thing and why I really love the Enneagram is that the Enneagram shows me what box I'm in, but that I'm always boxing in I'm boxed myself in with my own personality and my own identity and it also can show me the way out and that's why Hmm. I started learning it um and what do I mean by the way out how you can transcend so I'm interested in transformation and transcendence so how you can transcend 
the limits that you have automatically and unawaredly assumed for yourself. And my work with organizations was similar to that, is what are the limits that you have unawaredly yeah. and automatically assumed that are your limits and that don't have to be your limits. So that's what the Enneagram helps me do on a personal, uh, in a personal way with people. And then with teams, I've worked with a, a team uh, in Pfizer with the Enneagram and their awareness now of each other's particular Enneagram, as well as what is the team when it gets together function as, which is different. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Than anything. How does that work? That really helps them. It frees them up to actually use the appropriate and choose this appropriate contexts from which to deal with their concerns and situations, their goals, their, um, you know, fulfilling their dreams for their career, all those things. And that's why I really love using that. Yeah, I I too have a love for the Enneagram and the two kind of connections that I've made in my life is one that I had a similar experience. I'm an Enneagram too. And when I first started hearing, you know, what what does that look like or what is an Enneagram two? Who is an Enneagram two? I had the same experience that I did um honestly in a lot of my interpersonal communication classes where it was that mm -hmm. I was not being told something new really, but I was being given language for something I already knew to be true, but maybe hadn't had language for up until that point. And so when we talked about um, avoidance in conflict or, you know, different dynamics in relationships, I was able to say, oh, I have already experienced that. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like a recognition moment um, rather, rather than like a, I'm learning about something new and foreign. It's just, oh, now I have language for this thing I was already familiar with. And so that was my experience sitting in my communication classes, learning all of this great language that exists around communication theories. And then a similar experience as I learned about the Enneagram to feel like I already knew all these things to be true about myself. I'm just hearing it um, put into words in a way that I never had before, which to me mm -hmm. is incredibly empowering. Uh, I'm really glad about that. And has it given you more access to the other dimensions of your self? How has that happened? In a similar way in which knowing about CMM has, mm -hmm. which I would trace the roots of both of those back to meaning making. Mm -hmm. Because again, as I said, growing up, my understanding of the world was very black and white. So there mm -hmm. weren't any conversations about choices and how we made meaning. It was just, this is the meaning and, you know, because I said so kind of thing. And so when I started really diving into CMM and understanding the function of meaning making and how we choose to make meaning, that was liberating for me in a way to say, I, I can choose to make different meaning here. And it kind of helps me to feel more in control of the meaning I make rather than having the meaning control me. Cause I'm oh, thinking that's really that's, good, right. That I'm thinking it's the only yeah. way that meaning can be made. It just opens up a lot more room for conversation. And I, I just think that is the same function that Enneagrams had for me in my life as well to say, well, this is how I make meaning. Cause I've, I've tried to use it um, to try to understand other people in my life and other relationships. It's been helpful for understanding myself, but also myself in relationship to these other people who are all making meaning in their own way, which is not to say either of us is right or wrong, but just that they're different and they can coexist and they do coexist. And how can we best make them coexist? So there's less tension and friction and more collaboration. When you were thinking about yourself as the Enneagram too, did you also start to uh, recognize patterns of uh, patterns of how you would set up relationships? Yes. And how you would address those, and what were some of those patterns? Yeah, one of the I guess I don't know if you would call this a pattern, but one of the things that sticks with with me that. Um, I could point to a number of moments in my life and use now to understand uh, the choices I'm making or help to uh, affirm myself and the choices I'm making is that as a two, stating your needs is difficult because of the fear of 
stating those needs leading to disconnection when the greatest desire of the two is connection. And so I can see how throughout different relationships, I have avoided saying what I needed in order to preserve connection. And so only recently have I tried to be more aware of that in a way to change the meaning around that to say, you know, I, I'd like to be in the kinds of relationships where I can say what I need and also stay connected. Um, and so those are kind of the relationships I'm trying to cultivate. And so that feels like a, a pattern, if you will. What uh, is your Enneagram number? I identify uh, as a four, but specifically mm. as a self-preservation four, mm. which is the counter type to the main type. In other words, it looks least like ah. what fours normally quote or the general perception of four. So every type has three subtypes and it's the subtype. So let's let's think of the Enneagram in three different ways, um, at least just in terms of quote typing, okay? Yeah. So when we're born, we're, you could say we're born at our highest essence. There hasn't been any imprinting yet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or not much, right? So let's say we're born with an essence. Let's say that's the, the, the most, quote, true you. Doesn't have a lot of form or shape or color or dimensionality. It's being, pure being, right? All right. The ego develops. The ego is a mask. Yeah. It's the mask. It's trying to get back to that condition of being and pure essence, right? Well, then there's the mask of the mask, and that's the subtype. Mm, right. Okay? So, and the mask of the mask is influenced by the strongest survival instinct that you've got. And we all have three. Mm. We have self-preservation, which is about comfort, self-reliance, you know, basic needs, um, practical needs, um, like that. And um, that's one. Then we have a sexual or a one-to-one -one, uh, survival instinct. And that's all about, we know that we have to get intimate. Not necessarily sex or intercourse, but sure. intimacy, right? We we need intimacy. We need to belong to somebody. We need to actually connect powerfully with one other. And then there is um, the social instinct. We know we can't survive if we don't work in if we aren't in a group. Groups, <laughs> you know, the groups are. The human beings will die if they're not in a group, right? Right. So social, sexual, and self-preservation are the three dominant survival instincts. And that dominant, whatever is dominant, whichever instinct, survival instinct is strongest with you, combines with the main type passion or yeah. Uh, call it your vice or passion, really, the, the thing that is the driving force of that personality ego construction, right? Mm -hmm. That motivator. And envy is the passion of four. So what does envy really show up as most of the time is comparing. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks better over there than over here. How come I can't have what they have? How come yeah. I, you know, and here's another example of it. Admiring others so much that you don't factor in yourself, right? Or your needs, yeah, yeah. which is very close to two. Yes. Correct. So, so a self-preservation for as a counter type, and that means they don't look like Normally, fours are thought of as dramatic, romantic, um, very, very sensitive mm -hmm. beings um, uh, and conflicted a lot, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and very keyed in on authenticity and um, being creative. Okay, so how does the self-preservation show up that's a mask of that? They will see something they admire and they'll work hard to get it, never complaining about it, which is very contrary to the social four who mm. will complain a lot. <laughs> yeah. Or the sexual four who will get angry about it. Mm. You got that? So it's yeah. it's way different. Yeah. And so the healing path or the path, the transformational path for a self-preservation for looks very different from the transformational path to the other two right. subtypes. So do you know your subtype? I don't know my subtype. Okay. Well, that's um <clears throat> that that's something I would recommend you start to learn or find out yeah. about. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and I can recommend a great book about all that and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So if you'd like, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's so the work I do with the Enneagram is, and the Enneagram has so many dimensions and facets. Yeah, and it's it's really not just a personality, uh, a typing system, right? And it's so it's so much more complex than that. Um, it's all about, um, I would call it dynamic energy that's always moving and being aware of what's, what is, uh, motivating and shaping how you interpret and make meaning exactly like you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as well, as well as, uh, having access to all of the other dimensions of the Enneagram to make meaning. Mm -hmm. So there are some um, ways to find out about, for instance, in my profile, I identify as a main type four, but I have a lot of eight. I also have a lot of um, two. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, and and one of the things I have the least of is any type nine, which is all about peace yes, and about yeah. being e easygoing, right? Easygoing, right, right. seeing the whole, being peaceful and calm, and uh, and and that. So there's all kinds of things about it that make it fascinating for me. Yeah, I think a lot of my conversations that I've had on this podcast kind of come back to this idea of just our humanity and um, getting back to a place where we are allowed to live into and express the fullness of our humanity. I've had conversations about gender and about the ways that, you know, norms and stereotypes in our society keep us from uh, expressing our fullness because certain uh, qualities um, are attributed to different genders and um, that kind of gate keeps you from, you know, the other half. If, if I, um, you know, want to, if I need to feel angry, that's not as, you know, well received on a woman as a man generally, um, or if yes. a man wants to be nurturing or, you know, so maybe some other feminine qualities that again, are just things that we've made meaning on and chosen. Um, and yeah, just owning all, all of our stories and getting to be honest about the things that we struggle with and that not, you know, making us look weak, but enriching our uh, human experience and the way that we are with each other. And um, that's kind of what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that in knowing, in being able to identify with one number, but also understanding all the other numbers of the Enneagram. And like you said, the many, many beautiful layers and complexities within it, it feels like a version of letting ourselves step into our full humanity. Some people might feel like you said boxed in by saying you you are this number or that number, but it in if you are really understanding the Enneagram, I believe it's actually a kind of liberating thing that it's not trying to gatekeep you from all these other qualities or behaviors or motivations um, that are 
one of many ways that humans are in the world. It, it's, it's, it's expansive in that kind of way to invite you into your full humanity. For instance, it's not just your full humanity, it's other people's humanity. Yes. It's giving permission, acceptance, and welcoming other people's humanity. So let's talk about it and, and how do we do that? We can do that in an yeah. evolutionary way by understanding and uh, exploring and inquiring into the high sides or the essence of each one of the different types, especially on either side of you and how you might be showing or demonstrating aspects of, let's talk about you, Abby, uh, one of mm -hmm. any one or any of three. And there's low sides of that and there's high sides of that. And low meaning uh, automatic ego-driven ways, high mm -hmm, sides mm -hmm. meaning more integrated essence ego, more essence uh, expressed yeah. sides. And that's pretty an important, that's a pretty important thing. But plus the Enneagram and it for the most transformational change, you actually look at the dynamic lines and how you're related to other uh at types in the in the whole kind of like map of humanity, right, if you right. want to say, and how you're related to four, Abby, and how you're related to eight. Yep. And using again how do you use those well you gather resources at four you go into yourself so you were talking about needs before it's mm -hmm. difficult for you to say what you need it's not just difficult to say it that's when you're going to eight it's mm -hmm. difficult for you to know what your needs yes. are that's what you need to do first at four is yes. to understand what do i really want yeah and how am I, is that, am I just rolling over because I think that's what they'll want me to want? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, am I, or am I giving to them to get something back? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's very tough to, it's tough to keep aware that you're all, we're back to the CMM question. Uh -huh. what, do you make, what are you yes, making? Yes. How are you making it? You're making it through interpreting things and making meaning and then acting out of the meanings you've made, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what the Enneagram allows you to do is to really cut away the baloney yeah. in your stories and to get pretty clear about, ah, that's an old story I've got. Do I want to use that anymore? No. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have to use that story anymore. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's a pretty great tool. Um and and um uh opportunity for spiritual development. And that's what I'm currently doing with it. Yeah. And, uh, for myself as I am uh participating and practicing uh the diamond approach and which is another way of looking at life and how one evolves in life and mm -hmm. um using that a lot so yeah. yeah I just really keep coming back to this word that you know you use in your work of transformational yes and I feel that stories can be so transformational for us you know which ones we choose to tell ourselves and the ones that we hear and, you know, the untold stories too, obviously matter a lot. Um, and so I'm just curious, what, what's your understanding of what it means for something to be transformational or what is maybe the kind of transformational story that you hope to tell people? Uh, you mean personal story or what? I, however you want to answer that question i'm just curious maybe about the role of the transformational in 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 your life 
ah, there have been many critical moments of transformation in my life. Or you could also call them in the CMM way bifurcation points yeah. where that choice becomes uh, you could go one way or another. Right. Yeah. Um, most of my. Uh, OK, let's let's talk about design versus circumstance. And. You you like you said, you grew up in Indiana and you didn't have a complex view of things. Things were black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there was just an expectation. That's how, how it was always going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. It, would you call that a design life or a circumstantial life? Mm, a circumstantial, I guess. Yeah. So at every moment, as you were saying, we have an opportunity to choose yeah. what meaning are we making, correct? Yeah. What future are we creating? What present are we creating? What being in the present? Yeah, yes. Well, the um, my transformation points were initially triggered by bad circumstances. Alcoholic family, parents chose to get divorced. Yeah. You know, like, like different circumstances, right? And then in my second marriage, um, lots of circumstances combined and to uh, not good circumstances at the age of 45 for me to say, I can't stay married to you any longer. And I have to take the children. We, we you know, mm -hmm. I'll do shared custody, but I won't live with you anymore. And I won't take any money out of the marriage because I knew that if I did, I would never have any peace. So that mm -hmm. means no pension funds, no alimony, no, uh, I left the house. I left mm. a million dollar house. Yeah. Stuff. And had two small children, ages five and seven. That was a big transformational moment for me. <laughs> yeah. But the choice was, and here we go back. I didn't know the Enneagram then, but uh, I can see how my motivation at the time was, I have to, I have to live authentically to myself and I have to choose what is peaceful and respectful and works for myself, my sons, and even my ex-husband Yes, and move from there. So at the age of 45, I had two small children. I hadn't worked in five years and I hadn't, um, I hadn't worked in five years. And I, I couldn't go back into a career um, that uh, this thing I was doing. I so I didn't have a career and I had to pay half of having my ch children live. How was I going to do that? Boy, that was a big that was a big moment. And um, I used poetry, I believe it or not. Uh, Mary Oliver's poetry and oh, yeah, and um, specifically the wild geese poem, mm -hmm. and uh, and my network of friends and my network of love and support and friends, and I got a job as in a consulting a boutique consulting firm in New Jersey, even though I lived in California, and <sighs> I flew and I flew every other wow. week for work, oh. and. I raised my two sons and, you know, I went from nothing, having zero money, zero money. And the story was we, we, we had just moved out into the, this rental house and I had just rented this little house and my sons and I were in the car going to the ATM to get some cash and 
there was this homeless lady in the parking lot and I got cash for us. And I think I got something like $60. And this lady said, oh, please, will you help? I have children, have two children or three children, blah, blah, blah. And I gave her $20. And my mm -hmm. eldest son said to me, he was eight at the time or seven. And he said, mom, why did you give her so much money? We, we need that money. And I said, we, that she, we could be her. Mm. She needs it more than we do. We'll, yeah, we'll, wow. figure, we'll figure another way. And that's, you know, that because I, ch I choose to live that way rather yeah. than other ways. Yeah. And I'm responsible. I could, I could work. I could, you know, I could do things and, Anyway, so that's that was a transformational moment. But it, it was a very, it was a big deal at the time. And it remains. And I, you know, my courage, resilience, and I think my ethic around how I want to live my life was pretty strong. Mm. And that's the moment. Well, one, I really appreciate you sharing that story and, you know, living authentically is something that I really value too. And I think that's probably what makes me feel so drawn to those kinds of stories, the stories that I guess I would call the transformational moments, the bifurcation points of our lives, because I just think we we love a pretty story that is wrapped up in a bow and Everybody was happy the whole time and beginning, middle, end, and it's nice and clean. But really, those are not the stories of our lives. It's not usually how it goes. And I just, I think I just crave more of the stories that, again, the function I see it having is connecting us back to our humanity and our shared humanity. Yeah. Um, you know, and I can see that for you in that story, um, connecting with that woman and recognizing your own humanity, her humanity, and then me as a hearer of this story, feeling connected to you and my own humanity. And I just think that that feels like the practice, a one of, you know, the practice of making a better social world in the moment is sharing more of those stories and creating the spaces for others. I think that's what feels really important to me is that I, I can say, you know, share your stories all day long. Um, but who's hearing them and what does the space look like? And if you are going to be a, a teller of stories, then do you feel safe to do so? And who are the people that are are listening to you and making you feel like you will be heard? Um, and I wonder if that's, you know, maybe something that you think about as well, that maybe in some of your work, you are a, a, a hearer of stories or one of the people that is working to create this space so that the stories that need to be told have can be told and yes people I am. that need to tell them have the mm -hmm. space to do so right that's exactly right and because everyone needs to tell their story yeah mm -hmm. yeah and everybody's story is a little different it's not mm -hmm. all the same yeah and accepting those differences and really respecting and honoring those differences. It's really wonderful. Yeah. And I think that Enneagram has helped me even appreciate that more than ever. Yeah. Yes. Me as well. Yeah. Cause it does help you to say that, you know, your story is not right. And someone else's story is not wrong. It is all of these stories coexist and, and they can coexist. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Well, Rami, I, I so appreciate this conversation with you. And just as we wrap up, I want to know what else you want to say. What do you want to end this conversation with about stories or change or your own life? I, I think that I want to say that, I mean, I'm 72 and I'm still learning. And yes. I am going to be learning until I die. Yes. I mean, that's it. And we have an opportunity to live fully 
and live wholeheartedly and open-heartedly with a curious mind, the centered spirit mm. every single day. And I think that the ability to question and challenge what we're quote given yes. or what we've inherited or what has been expected is so essential to living a full life. And then the courage to go and explore things and to try new things on and to invent possibility and to co-design, co-create, collaborate for a new constitutive social reality in all kinds of ways, in your marriage, in your friendships, in your, you know, volunteer organizations, in your workplaces, in your spiritual organizations, in the world, in the government. You know, I mean, I talked about working in corporations. I've also worked in county and city governments a lot. Mm. And it's it's a lie that civil servants don't want to do anything. That's a mm. lie. Yeah. Um, and everybody, every person wants to make a difference somehow, some way with someone else and to respect how that bubbles out of them is critical. Mm. As I said, my purpose is for, is for people to discover and delight with what really matters in life. That's it. I think that is very well said and beautiful and I, this conversation has just energized me and I appreciate that as one of the things that I get out of uh, doing this podcast is getting to have energizing conversations with interesting people like you. So again, I just, I so appreciate your time today and your perspective and the stories that, that you've shared. It's really, it means a lot to me. You're welcome. And, you know, I have really good teachers currently, I, you know, the, the, the people that I interact with in the diamond approach. Mm -hmm. The people that uh, the Beatrice Chestnut and Uranio Paez and Chestnut Paez Enneagram Academy, um, Deep Coaching Institute, um, uh, people through IEQ9 um, is an organization um, also about the Enneagram. I mean, there's and every dialogue partner, as Barnett Pierce would used to say, every dialogue partner that was every book I read and everything else. And mm -hmm. so find good teachers, you know, read a lot, yeah, you know, yeah. engage with people, get out there. I think it's great. And I'm thrilled with what you're doing. I'm so impressed Thanks, with Rami. it. And I really learned from you today about meaning making in an, another whole way um, and another whole take. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, Rami. Okay, that is all for our conversation with Rami. As you reflect on part one and part two of this conversation, I want you to keep thinking about the question I posed at the beginning of the episode today, which you can also find in the show notes, and that is, what are the limits you place on yourself? I'd also have you go back and think about the question I asked at the beginning of part one, which is, what is possible? With the follow-up question to that being, what else is possible once we start to ask ourselves? what is possible. I think these two questions are great to reflect on together so you can understand what is possible and then get out of your own way by acknowledging the things that might be limiting you and making new choices. As always, I am supported by the CMM Institute for Personal and Social Evolution. This podcast is one of many initiatives that is moving us toward uh, a new present of a better social world kind of like what we talked about with Rami today, trying to make that better social world in the present moment in each episode. As far as a next turn for the podcast, please share this episode along with part one with someone you want to invite into the conversation. Another key part of developing a communication perspective is to be in dialogue with people. So bring others into this space 
and also reach out to me. That's a great way to stay in dialogue too. You can reach me through email, through the website, or through commenting on Instagram and YouTube. You can find links to all of these places in the show notes. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being curious and thank you for being a part of this story. I'm Abby and this has been Stories Lived, Stories Told. 